Kia ora koutou, nā mai hari mai. Uh, we are back with another episode in the UC Business School Masterclass series, and it's my pleasure to be talking to Professor David Mick. Uh, I'm going to read out a little bit of a bio about how amazing David is, because there was no way I could remember everything. Uh, but David is the Robert Hill Carter Eminent Professor of Commerce at the McIntyre School of Commerce uh, in the University of Virginia. Uh, David and I have known each other for maybe 15 plus years, I guess, on and off well. over, the, yeah. over the years. Um, but as way of background, David, uh, his area of research is very much in man managerial pragmatics, broadly include consumer behavior, transformative consumer research, rhetoric of advertising, and really what I find interesting, weaving in some Eastern philosophies into what you do as well. Uh, he has held a number of positions and a number of visiting positions, sp spoken and worked with some of the most important people around the world in our field. But most importantly, he's here as an Erskine Fellow at the moment uh, and has been with us for the last, what, two or three months now with yeah. your partner. So it's yeah. been a real pleasure to have David here. Uh, and so it's just a real honor to have you to talk about a little bit more about your sort of work, what you do, and, and where you kind of see the future going in this sure. sort of area in particular. So uh, Thank you, Ikan. Thank yeah. you. Um, and, and I guess going right back to why you're here, I know you tried to get here in about 2020 as an Erskine Fellow, and um, for obvious reasons, we yeah. couldn't host you. But you stayed the course, and you finally made it in 2023, end of 2023. Uh, what, what, what was it about UC, or what was it about New Zealand that made you thought, I, I really want to come here? Well, uh, I've had the really uh, great opportunities to teach at other places around the world during my career. We spent a year in uh, Copenhagen at the business school and a year in Dublin. Uh, taught at the University of Sydney about 15 years ago for a while and a number of other places. And so my wife and I have enjoyed living around the world. And uh, plus I've had friends like yourself and a few others here on the faculty at the UC Business School. And so it just seemed like a really good fit. Um, then COVID occurred and, and things kind of got delayed. But um, I, you know, I think there's two main reasons for myself as well as I think anybody else who has the opportunity to do this is first professionally to network and talk to other faculty about their research and to share ideas and so forth. And uh, secondly, it's just on a personal basis that I, I've often or, al or always have been uh, a strong uh, proponent of travel and talking to my students about it, the importance of getting out and getting beyond your, your comfort zone and getting into other cultures, other nations, other parts of the world because it's just so enriching to see uh, how the rest of the world lives and it just expands your perspective. I know it's had effect on my, my research and just on my own satisfaction with my career, but to be able to get out and come here and, and in the case of New Zealand, it's, uh, it's not, to me, it's not just majestic, it's miraculous. It's unbelievable to be in the, the countryside, you know, and see those mountains and lakes and rivers mm -hmm. and everything, and the people, the native, uh, the Kiwis, uh, and learning about the Maori traditions. It, it's, been a, it's been a really, really terrific mm -hmm. experience, and we're leaving in about a week to go back to the United States. Mm -hmm. and we're kind of sad. We're happy to be going back in certain ways, but sad to be leaving. Yeah, I mean, and it, we've got mutual friends who have come in, Erskine Fellows, and been guiding you. And similarly, you know, I was talking with Stacy again about how to get her back. She's so mm. desperate to come back. And yeah. we do leave a little bit of a, that bug inside you. So it's good, yeah. it's good. I was gonna ask you why is New Zealand the best place on earth, but I think you've done that. Well, uh, it, <laughs> it, it, it is, it's uh, pretty remote, but uh, most people have heard that it's beautiful, but they really don't have any idea till they come and see it up close. Yeah. And we were literally talking on the walk over here about different locations. I'm going to be over yeah. summer just on right. a family vacation. I, I would love to go there. So that, yeah. that sense of especially exploring different parts of the world and how you say it weaves into your, um, your research. I mean, you're, you're well known as an advertising semiotics branding consumer researcher, but you weave in that Eastern philosophy into your work um, quite interestingly. I mean, have you experienced tensions in that space? How has that been received, especially when you're working in uh, a university which might have a view on what business research might be? Well, I've been fortunate to have support from my deans and faculty. Um, I, you know, I, I probably have been a bit of an out-of-the-box kind of researcher most of my career. It's sort of the 
uh, it, it's the high risk but bigger payoff when it works. But I, I've had a, a, a share of my own research rejected by the journals as well because sometimes the topics or perspectives I've taken have been outside the norm. Uh, and I've had a 40-year interest in Buddhism, and so it, it definitely has influenced my thinking about mindfulness and decision-making and uh, other aspects of Buddhist philosophy, mm -hmm. secular Buddhism particularly, sure. but, um, but there have been some others. And I always encourage when I meet with other faculty is to, to ask big questions and take chances. If you, if you do research that is more conventional and what anybody else would expect, then it feels good to publish that work, but often its impact is, is more limited, if you will. But everybody has to find what they like to do and what fits their, their methodological skills and so forth. But, but yeah, I, I mean, uh, th th to make a point, I mean, the, I had a couple papers published from a Buddhist psychological perspective about consumer behavior. Oh, that article originally got, got rejected by one of the top journals, mm -hmm. and so I had to work on it a lot more. Um, it, and it got influenced by the opportunity. I had to actually go to Tibet uh, with a religious studies professor at the University of Virginia, and that was a, just an amazingly life-affecting experience for me to be able to be there. I, I brought back more momentum to want to write that paper and persist in trying to publish it. Uh, so uh, again, travel ties in, but I, you know, so you, you have to you have to do in terms as a researcher. I think you have to do what you have a passion for and what you love. And you can't sit back too much and ask what's going to be easier to publish or not. You just have to you just do the best you can and hope hope for the best. But we do have this privilege as researchers that freedom to to study the things that we think are important. And if they don't hit, they don't hit. But That's we have right. other opportunities. That's right. Uh, let's say I'm a manager at a at a local firm and I want to try and do something a little bit outside the box, maybe countercultural. Do you have some ideas or advice on how you might weave that in, or is this uh, something that's a bit beyond the sort of work that you do? Well, that's a, that's a good question. It's a tough question. I think that you have to read your audience well. Mm. You have to know what their prior biases are, and, and you have to choose your words carefully. I mean, I think that uh, as I worked on the particular paper, that we're talking about one in particular that had a Buddhist background, I had to find a way to introduce the ideas without seeming threatening or mm. that I wasn't calling everybody else's research, you know, insignificant or something silly like that. And I think anytime you're trying to sell ideas to a board or to employees, you have to, uh, you have to be willing to be bold, but, but you have to take it, take it easy at first and sort of read, read their reactions. And uh, if, if you're using logic and examples and, and your, your heart's in the right place, then people will listen. Mm. And, and that quick throwaway line you th uh, said a couple of sentences ago about, you know, it, you might get it published, but it's not going to have the same sort of impact. One of the examples of this that I use in my, my class all the time is you wrote a paper some years ago, I'm not going to say how many years ago, but over a couple of decades ago on the paradoxes of technology. And I have to remind my students that this paper was written prior to social media, when the internet was at its infancy, That's right. when cell phones didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And those paradoxes that you developed 20, 25 years ago stand true today. They seem to, I they think seem so. To. Uh, how, I mean, how do we, how do you incorporate, or how did you come about thinking about that long-term impact? How do, you, uh, how do you address a certain issue here but open it up to still be relevant 25 years later? I mean, yeah. was that part of well, your I thinking? Don't, I don't you think you can plan that. I, I think you have to know that you're dealing with, uh, I'll use a big word, that you're dealing with something profound in the mm. case of technology. And if you really have produced some insights that people haven't thought of before, there's a good chance that it, it's going to have some legs. It's going to, I have other things I've published that have not been mm -hmm. cited as much over the years. But that paper in particular has been probably one of my more cited papers because it just strikes people that technology is paradoxical. It, it, it frees us, it enslaves us, mm -hmm. it gives us control, and yet we're on the precipice of chaos when it breaks down or, or whatever, you know, and you don't know how to fix it. It can bring people together or it can separate people. Mm -hmm. And those are things that we were finding out back then. And uh, I had, if you'd asked me, I wouldn't have known 25 years later with cell phones and social media and everything else, that many of those ideas would still apply. But I think when you're, as a researcher, when you're asking some really deeply profound questions about society and about everyday life, there's a good chance you're going to come up with insights that are going to have some stickiness to them, mm -hmm. some stability. 
And that paper probably is one of the ones that I've been fortunate to have uh, continued to have cited. Mm -hmm. I had a terrific uh, co-author also. She and I published some other papers, Susan Fournier, mm -hmm. uh, who's now the dean of the business school at Boston University. Um, she just was a terrific partner, so I was very fortunate too. Susan's just a good human being She's as well. great. Just a She's humble great. person, just she is. amazing researcher. Yeah. Um, where I think you and I first interacted was, uh, so in 2005 you were the president of the Association of Consumer Research. It's the largest academic association uh, for consumer researchers. Um, I think annually their conference get 12, 1300 people coming mm -hmm. along. And, mm -hmm. and you were the president of this big entity and you gave a presidential address basically saying, in summary, we're not doing enough. We're not doing well enough. We That's could be right. doing better. Right. Uh, and from there stems this thing called transformative consumer research. I wondered right. if you want to tell us a little bit about what transformative consumer research is to you and why you felt the need to drive people to think about this, this area. Well, again, you know, when I was g preparing to my remarks as a presidential address in 2005 at that association, I, I can vividly remember sitting on the back deck of a house. We were ma visiting some friends and they'd left me alone. I, I was sitting there with my coffee thinking, well, you, you've, I don't have much time left. There are only a couple more months. I've got to develop this speech. And I just sat there and I thought to myself, what? What, what does my heart tell me? What do I really believe? And, and also a little bit of what bothers me. I've been in this field for a long time. And I, I just continued to come back to this notion that uh, there was some terrifically good research going on by so many people. But when it came to the consumer welfare and environmental welfare, there were some people working uh, on topics there. But, but those people, for the most part, weren't among, in my opinion, the most uh, um, reputed or appreciated. Their work wasn't often getting into the top journals. And I just felt that they were, they were um, uh, th their work needed to be held up more for this, the, the association to see the value of what they were doing and to welcome and call more people to come into this space. Because it doesn't take somebody with advanced education to see that our environment, our societies, technology, so many things are becoming more complicated, in some cases really um, dangerous, if mm -hmm. you will, in some respects uh, with the way things have gone, especially environmentally. But, but you know, it's, um, uh, so I decided to write a, an address that would try to call to these people, this is the time, we can't wait much longer before we all come together as a field to deal with these really difficult problems and opportunities of consumer behavior. You know, and um, I, I had three other people that were helping me put the conference together. Mm -hmm. We were on a conference call and I expressed some of these ideas to them, but I said, but, but you know, we're marketing people. How, how are we going to quote unquote brand this? What are we gonna call it? And we started having a discussion. And I have to admit, it wasn't myself that came up with the phrase transformative consumer research. It was Lisa Penalosa. Mm -hmm. And she said it during that conference call and the, the other three of us said, that's it. I think we've got it, you know. And so I been, built my argument around using that phrase. And, um, and from there, it, it just, uh, I, I, I had no idea how much it was gonna affect people that, mm. again, I, I just tried to speak from my heart, but I had so many people come up to me afterwards because I, I had kind of hit a latent need, a deep down concern that many of these people had, but nobody was getting the pulpit or the podium the way I did for 20 minutes that day in front of 600 plus people. And so I decided to, what the heck, you know, I'll do it. And the, the response was way beyond mm what I would have expected. So it's kind of back again to what, what do you stand for? What do you believe in and are you willing to talk about? And uh, I, I was amazed. I was, I was just so amazed. And within, by the end of that conference, I had 50 more people, including yourself, coming up to me saying, I want to be involved. Let, let's do this. Mm -hmm. and, and from there, Things like we raised money to, mm -hmm. to support grant research, which had never been done before in the association. I think the number now is over $300,000 that has been raised. Now, that not quite at the figures that federal governments raise for scientific and medical research, but within our field, that's a, that's a big number. Mm. And also we started having conferences, conferences. you know, yep. every other year that we'd pull people together to talk about you know, problems of like obesity or addictions or um, uh, financial literacy. I mean, we can go on to all these important topics that our field had really not given 
much attention to it, which is pretty unbelievable when you think about it. But the time had come. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, Victor Hugo said that nothing can stop an idea whose time has come. Mm. And, I, and I had no idea that that transformative consumer research was going to do that. But as you know, the grant money, the conferences, uh, the, the special issues of certain journals, mm -hmm. some of the papers that have come out of the TCR conferences have won awards Most at top issues, journals yeah. now, yeah. which is exactly what I was hoping would happen because prior, you know, people were doing the work, but they were not being given, I think, the the appropriate appreciation for what they were doing, kind of fighting the, the current of the field. And now the current has been really shifted. And, and I wonder if it is a case of there are great people clearly working in this area, great people who deeply care, but without a critical mass or at least some exactly. sort of branding or some sort of connection. Right. It, it, it was easy to pick off the individuals here and there, but as a collective, it's much right. harder. I know when I go outside the university and give talks and I introduce myself, I'm like, I'm in the most evil of the university schools. I'm in a business school. I'm in the most evil of all the departments. I'm in the marketing department. And, marketing, and, and you right. kind of, and that reputation of marketing being the cause of a lot of these problems, but very rarely seen as part of the solution. Right. We're still dispelling outside the walls, but also within the field. I mean, do you experience that yourself? Do you have to? apologize for being a marketer or a consumer researcher or uh, you know is this, is this I don't find too much of that but there has been a long history of marketing being seen as a kind of uh, a manipulative activity mm. uh, and there certainly are aspects of marketing that have there have been marketers that have done some really uh, bad stuff uh, in terms of the way they've treated consumers or deceived them and this and that but there's been research on that and there can be more about uh, and, and not all marketing has to be manipulative. It's a, it's a complex question because I if I influence you about what brand of car you buy or something like that, have I influenced you or have I manipulated you? Wh where's the line the there? Line. Because influence is something that we all do every day with each other, but manipulation is usually when it's built with an intent in mind mm -hmm. for the person to make a choice or do something that might be contrary to their to their, their well being yeah. or okay. to their own interests. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, so that's where manipulation kind of becomes more than just influence. But but you're right. I I think that it's had a history. But you know, l let's face it too. There are a lot of other industries. Uh, the legal profession, the political scientists or politicians, e you know, e even physicians and other uh, health areas. Some of them have got some shady sort of history stuff that was going on too. For sure. You know, so. We're, we're not alone, but, but we are the, the masters of our destiny and our own reputation. So we have to take it upon ourselves to, to mm -hmm. stop the bad behavior and to try to reverse it and, and inspire our, our, our students to do the very best. And the associations, whether it be the Association for Consumer Research or New Zealand's uh, a Marketing Association or the American Marketing Association, they've got to step up. They've got to say, these are our ethics, these are our values, and we're going to call out those who don't follow what we believe in. Mm. And so it takes a lot of leadership and some, some guts to do it. And we see this in a lot of young people. I, I know mm. you're still teaching regularly. You taught one of the classes here while you were on your fellowship. Um, a lot of young people will do a little bit for money. Mm. They might go a little further if it aligns with their career aspirations. But when things align with their values and they feel like not only their work is having an impact, but that impact is meaningful, then you really see people, especially uh, younger people these days, say, I I'm willing to, to take a pay cut in order to achieve that. I'm willing to. And so that notion of not just meaningful work, but impactful work as well. Very well, much I think the rising generation now, we, you know, we know that, that, first of all, they're extremely concerned and very anxious about what's going on in the world right now. And they very well should be. Um, and and they're, they're just waiting and wanting to be inspired mm. to become the leaders that we know that we need. <clears throat> it's hard. They're afraid. They're young. But that's partly the role of professors and, and other people in education and mentors in business to encourage them to, uh, to join, join in and, and bring their voice mm -hmm. and express and, and, and the new ideas they're getting in the classrooms and so on and so forth. But um, I find that uh, the students you know, of today are, you know, they're facing very different challenges than what you and I did at their age. And uh, we have to give them hope. We have to give the next generation hope. Mm. Um, and, and that's what I 
am trying to do and you yourself and others that I know in the field. I, I'm marking a, a exams at the moment, so I don't know how much hope I'm giving them once that gets back. We will see. No, they're, well, they're doing pretty well. Um, one of the things about TCR in particular, and we'll, we'll move on from TCR soon, but uh, one of the things that was central, I think, to what you said was not just let's do research that's for well-being and for people's betterment, but let's return that knowledge back to people as well. Right. Let's not silo this within academia, within right. journals. And we've got to the point now where we're having impact conferences, where we're trying to translate right. this into the real world. W why was that so central to your thinking 25 years or 20 well, years ago? Well, I, I think TCR is, a, is about impact. If we're not going to plan right from day one how we're going to help organizations, for-profit, non-profit, that have missions for improving the welfare of the environment, of society, of children, of animals, or whatever mm -hmm. it is. You know, we, we have to know what their problems and challenges they're facing and build our research around trying to contribute to the resolution of those problems through their organizations and decision making. And if we're not going to have impact, if we're not going to be relevant, mm -hmm. then why are, why are we doing this? Um, the, you know, we, we, we have to, as one philosopher, um, um, Nicholas Maxwell, he's in the UK, has said, you know, at universities, we have to get away from knowledge production, we have to get to wisdom production. Mm -hmm. And the difference is, wisdom is about knowledge and applying knowledge, but it's for the good, it's for, for the good. common good. It's sure. driven by values and ethics, whereas a lot of just pure knowledge research, theoretical research, which still needs to be done, whether it's in chemistry or pharmaceuticals or mm -hmm. whatever, but they often don't know where it's going. And some major discoveries have come from that kind of work where they had no idea what they were working on. And all of a sudden, there was an insight, and, you know, oh my gosh. But really, we have to become more backwards in our research. We have to start with the question, how can I help you? What don't you know? Mm. What, what, what can we do to help you? Whether we're talking about, again, uh, uh, for-profits, non-profits, government, whatever it might be that are dealing with challenges of well-being. We have to work backwards from mm. how we can help them, partner with them, and we have, as you've said, so that's one of the, 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 the developments within TCR are bringing in the executives from these organizations to have these dialogues. Because that, if you go back in the history of the Association for Consumer Research, it just has not happened at all. Now, the marketing field has been historically a little bit better in that. I, I'm thinking of like the Marketing Science Institute yeah, yeah. in Boston. They have a heavy contingent of executives who attend their conferences and their meetings, and their executives are constantly being expected to share what they're struggling with so that the marketing researchers there can develop their own work to try to help solve, resolve some mm -hmm. of those executives' problems. But in the field of consumer research, which is what we're mostly talking about, that just hadn't happened until TCR finally came along. I think it's one of the absolute frontiers and continuing frontiers of what we should do in TCR. Yeah, perfect. And uh, unfortunately, not easy. But if you think about it, uh, if you want to affect behavior change, especially change that is positive for society, working with people to enable that rather than talking at people and telling them what they should, shouldn't do, right. is just so much more effective to Absolutely. work with. Absolutely. Yeah. And Pe people have to yeah. feel a, a self-motivation. They have to be intrinsically drawn. Yep. You know, and right. At very much at the heart. Right. Uh, you've got plenty of years left in you, I'm sure. I, n I mean, I know you gave a, a research presentation for our department a few right. weeks ago as well, and uh, your latest projects, you're still firing away. What are the sort of the, the f next steps for you and, and, and your plans for the future? For Well, I've been working on this wisdom word, mm. okay? I've been working on, I, I, I sort of, in a, uh, my undergraduate background was in philosophy, mm. which is the Greek word for love of wisdom, although oddly within the field of philosophy, you can't find many people talking about wisdom per se, but I discovered the wisdom literature around 2005 within social science. I had no idea that there were people trying to theorize and actually collect data mm. up on what does it mean to be wise and how that can improve your well-being or your flourishing, let's say. And I became interested in that, and for the last 15 years I've conducted some different studies. I've connected it to some of the Buddhism stuff. Uh, I've recently been working on a, a paper involving how do we become wiser in the way that we use social media. What does that mean? 
Um, and, and wisdom is about not being impulsive, not being reactive, about being a little more slowed down. Mm -hmm. It's about being able to take short and long-term perspectives in your decision making and take a broad view of who the stakeholders are who tend to be, who can be affected by your decision making. So that how will I be affected? How will interpersonally you and I be affected? Mm -hmm. How will the broader this environment be affected by my decision making? And, and, and to come to pull that together for the common good. I mean, that's kind of quickly what wisdom is about, although it's a complex word in a long literature. I say. So I, I've been working on that. More recently, uh, you mentioned a pa paper or a, a research I presented recently is that um, uh, I, I, I've been, because my background also was in literature and in rhetoric, I've often, for a long time, I've been interested in this topic, which, which has been in the literature called puffery. Mm -hmm which comes back to the way marketers have exaggerated, okay? One of the most famous historically in the United States was Barnum and Bailey Circus, where their motto was, the greatest show on earth, okay? Well, of course, they, they could make that statement, but they had no proof. Well, and that's kind of a funny, you know, and if you go back and look at ads in the 1880s, 1890s, when they were appearing in magazines and newspapers, these kinds of exaggerations were occurring everywhere, and the government began to form uh, some studies and, and some uh, regulation about, about that. But, but they also took the perspective, especially in the courts, because there was some lawsuits uh, alleging deception when people, when companies would would you know execute a puffery, if you mm. will, okay, um, and uh, but the position that got taken was that consumers know puffery when they see it, and they don't get they don't get taken in by it. But then there was some new empirical research where, in fact, they found it believable, um, if if not consciously, it was affecting them. So. I recently decided to use two or three research assistants of mine to go out and look for examples of puffery, okay? Packaging and, and billboards and advertising and social media, you know? And what, what happened was it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely everywhere. Strideline Socks calls themselves the greatest sock on earth. Now, you know, uh, even Ben and Jerry's ice cream is uh, Ver uh, Vermont's finest. So it's when something is said to be better or best or more, or most, and, and that, that's kind of what puffery is, are these exaggerations. And when you begin to, to look around, it, it, it is just everywhere, okay? Mm -hmm. And not only is it everywhere, but it began to dawn on me uh, that nobody had connected that to branding, and in particularly a, a word that we know is so central to marketing is differentiation. If you're gonna be successful as a brand, you have to be different in a way that makes a difference in people's lives. So this notion of differentiation, ER, differ, well, that's what puffery is about. Mm -hmm. It's better, it's more, it's best, it's most. And so these companies are just throwing out puffery left and right as a way to hold themselves up to be differentiated. And so I, the, the, what I began to wonder is that what, what does it mean for consumers to be the fish that are in the water of puffery every mm -hmm. day and don't even realize what's going on? And so the, the, what I began to realize when you think about it is that major philosophies, going back to Aristotle about the role of, me, of moderation or Epictetus and the Stoics, you can go through all the major religions, uh, Christianity and Islam and Hinduism and Buddhism, you know, all of them have argued that one way to not be happy in life is to want more or something different than what you have because it, it evokes ingratitude. It even kind of makes you restless, if mm -hmm. you will. The, the grass is always greener on the other side of the hill. You know? And so I, t I take that and develop that argument and I'm kind of making the point, at least it's a bit of a hypothesis, that puffery may be psychologically in a sense more detrimental or potentially uh, a kind of a jeopardy in our lives and our economies when marketers are just puffing everywhere mm -hmm. and not being called out for it. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's a recent thing I've been working on and I, I think I'm gonna hopefully collect some data on this. There are ways to get at you know, uh, exposing people to puffed statements without them realizing that that's the central focus of the work is common in psychology. It's, it's kind of in the, what's called the priming uh, paradigm. And what happens is then you take certain dependent variable measures at the end and you find out whether or not those who saw a lot of puffery versus those that don't 
do they ex do do they have certain reactions that the other group doesn't have? For sure. So so and that's um, that's, that's what I've been, and I, and that's what I've been working on, and uh, I don't know. It's we'll see we'll see how the journal what the journal thinks of it. <laughs> we we'll see what the journal thinks. <laughs> I mean, one of my favorite marketing quotes is um, the grass is greener on the other side because it's usually fertilized with bullshit. So that's right. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's where that's the right. sewer line runs. <laughs> that's, that's right. That's right. So this is where marketers, especially, don't yeah. play that positive role in developing that, and we're potentially seeing in the data the effects on consumers. Um, and very quickly, going back yeah. to your your wisdom work, I was already starting to think of a, a series. I mean, we've been talking about mindfulness, which has its roots in uh, Eastern philosophy mm -hmm. for, for a long time. Mindful eating, mindful consumption, mindful spending, having wise eating, wise consumption, wise spending, wise parenting. I'm thinking about the, the most common thing I'm asked to talk about is how do you, how do you raise your kids in the, year of s in the age of social media? So why social media use, both for parents and for kids? the sort of uh, opportunities for well-being from that right. would, be, would be huge. Um, I'm going to finish up with a... By the uh, way, go. this is an enormous issue oh, for anybody say. who's seeing this interview. One of the big names is Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T. Yep. I, I know Jonathan kind of as an acquaintance. I mean, he took... Um, he, he's just done a bunch of research different ways about it, so I'll just mention one. It's not the only, but he basically mapped the rise of social media, which is around 2012, and, and coming through the teens, he mapped it onto uh, mental hospital admissions and suicides among teenagers, and especially young girls, mm -hmm. and the two just go like this. Mm -hmm. It's really, really scary. Really so parents have to do, it's difficult, but they have to do their best to educate their kids about what is the nature of social media, what are some of the really good aspects of it, but where and in what ways can it possibly be yep. really negative for, for young people. Absolutely. It, it, it's a very serious issue. Very serious issue. It is. Um, I, I used to ask the final question of, you know, uh, what breaks your heart at the moment? Because w when there's a problem, maybe we can think about solutions, but that just got too depressing. So now I ask people, what's giving you hope? What, what, what's the thing that gives you hope for the future? And I know you mentioned a couple of things already, but is there something in, in your mind that gives you hope for well, the future? Well, it, it, there are moments when it's not easy when you see the wars that are going on, the new, new wars and all the concerns about uh, the environment and, and its effect on, on animals and, and the air and everything else. But I, we, we have to believe in the new generation. We have to believe in, in these young people that are coming along now and, and tell them that you can get involved and you can make a difference because it's just, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't, I, you know, the, some of these problems seem intractable, but we can't give up. I think, I forget who it was who said that sometimes the hardest problems are the ones that are really worth working on. Mm. If they're small problems, then who really cares? But we have to work on these big problems and, uh, and because they are so concerned. I, I think that, I, I, here's one thing, I, I was at a conference one time when the speaker was uh, Deepak Chopra, hmm. uh, you know, a new age kind of philosopher kind of a guy, but he's very, very bright. And he was giving a talk about some of these similar things. And he said something that just stuck with me, um, that he said, we are now at a point when we think about all the challenges in the world, so much of it, by the way, it has to do with consumption or consumer behavior. We consume everything, clothing, the air, the technology, our cars, our food. We think consumption is a rather you know, limited phenomenon in our lives. It, in fact, is pervasive. But what he said was, we are now in an age and we're moving forward that it's no longer survival of the fittest. Mm. He said, it's survival of the wisest. And you can imagine, I heard that word, because <laughs> I had started working on wisdom, and I had no idea what he was going to say. But he was saying the people and the societies that are going to survive and still thrive with their children, their grandchildren, and whatever, are those that are going to make wise decisions about the way we're living now and what the future is, and not just use power and authority, which is the survival of the fittest, if you will, uh, to see who makes it and who doesn't. We're, we're past that now. And so we have to have vocal democracy. We have to have welcomed diversity. We have to be able to all work together. We're all in this together. And if, if we can't come together and, and, and share some goals and, and get our egos out of the way, then, then it's gonna be harder to have hope. Mm. But 
but I think here, and especially in New Zealand, I think there truly is a, an opportunity for this culture and this society and these students to sort of be a leading light. But when you think about the way in, that New Zealand has tried to protect the environment, the way it is uh, smartly using water um, and, and, and wind and, and, and sunlight, to, to, to drive electricity and to drive other breakthroughs and to protect the environment, trying to save some of the endangered species around New Zealand, the penguins and so forth and whatnot. These are going on in other places with different, different factors, if you will. But I think we have to, we have, to have hope in the next generation because uh, I, I, I don't know what else the solution is and they want to work on it and, and, and I believe they can. We have to support them. And, and, mentor them and get out of the way. And just your, the kōrūrū, your, your, the, the language you're using, the words you're using, just and the, the this dialogue is very much aligned with what we as a business school are, are trying to do. We've recently recognized as the first business school in Australasia to get this BSIS accreditation, which shows we're having a positive impact within our community and a social impact within our community, which is great. And it's not just a tag to say, well done, this is something you might do. It's because there have been leaders. And I should recognize Professor Lucy Ozan, who is your host while here. Right. Lucy's another world leader in this area. Anne-Marie Kennedy, who's doing amazing work in the macro social marketing area. So right. many people who are working in this area in our little village here in the end of the world, right. hopefully trying to do a, a good thing. But I think by bringing other professors here like myself, and you all are doing this through the generous Erskine uh, Foundation, I, th I think it's just terrific. Uh, my wife and I have sometimes sat and talked and wondered about where else is there anything <laughs> quite like this Erskine program uh, that has that level of support? And I, I can't think of any. You know, if a professor wants to go abroad and live somewhere for a little while and interact, often it's they have to bring their own financial resources, which they may or may not have. Mm. But to have this this really enriching and 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 uh, re well resourced foundation to be able to make it easier to bring people over and to send. You see faculty abroad as well to interact in other places, I think is the way to get the word out about what's going on well at the University of Canterbury, but, but in general in New Zealand itself. Mm. Uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's really inspiring. Awesome. I, I think that we have more people that are standing up and speaking up about some of the really big dilemmas that we face uh, existentially across the world and we have to get packed past just talking about it now. Mm -hmm. We've got to figure out a way to work together to solve these. And consumer researchers, because of the pervasiveness of consumption, the fact that consumption can be pro-welfare, uh, if you will, or it can be anti-welfare, mm -hmm. I think consumer researchers have an enormous role to play. And they are within marketing departments, so that means marketing itself. So we can, we just have to have the leaders and we have to have the people with the energy to do it. Well, Professor David Mick. It's been an absolute honor to host you here at UC. It's been an honor to chat with you. It's just been great to have you around and hope you can come back soon with you, yourself and your family. So Thank you so appreciate much. It. I appreciate it.